This episode of Inside EMS is brought to you by Lexapol, the experts in policy, training, wellness support, and grants assistance for first responders and government leaders. To learn more, visit Lexapol.com. That's L-E-X-I-P-O-L.com. Well, it's Friday, and everybody knows it's Friday. It's time to go inside EMS. I am your host, Chris Subalero, with you once again to bring you the latest and greatest about what's happening inside EMS. But here he is. You can see his face if you're following us on YouTube. He is the man of the hour, too sweet to be sour. The ladies know he's the man with the power. Kelly Grayson, KG, welcome back after a couple weeks of being away from the show. Yeah, it's good to be back, man. Good to be back. I've, I've had a chance to relax and chill for the past couple of weeks and went to a little writer's retreat this in, in the Texas Panhandle, the same one that I almost died at last year. So Yeah, that's why you found the that you had the embolism last year, right? Yeah, that's the one where I had the, I came back looking looking and feeling a whole lot better. So Well, I mean, let's just talk what the difference a year makes. So you were probably in the high three hundreds last year. Uh, I when was 400 pounds at, oh, were you uh, really? on April yeah. 14th of last year. I was trying to make you feel better. So mid 300 pounds, but you've lost probably about a hundred pounds since then. Pretty close. I'm, I'm in the three teens right now. It would be a lot. Uh, it'd be lower than that if I could, you know, get to the damn pool, but life conspires to get in the way. But yeah, I'm, I'm down to about 314 right now. So one of the things, I mean, you're really on the cusp of almost 200 pounds very quickly. I mean, that's just a couple months away, man. So cheers to you for doing mm-hmm. that. So one of yeah. the things that I want to just really, it's not what we're here to talk about today, but I think there are a lot of people in EMS that have a challenge of trying to get back into shape, that have had some challenges maybe with health. And Kelly, this was touch and go for you for a little bit to where you could, uh, I'd be sitting here talking to an empty apartment right now. But, but I mean, what pieces of advice do you have? Because if you can do it, I mean, really, anybody can do it, right? I mean, because you're a busy yeah. guy. You've got tons yeah. of deadlines. You've got multiple jobs that you're working on. You're running your own company. You're writing your own books. I mean, so yeah. when we think about this from a standpoint of how do we prioritize and how do we create a habit for better living? And over a year, I mean, with, you know, 80 pounds, that's not something to sneeze at. No, no, it's... I think the, the first thing I would tell people is, is you, you have to prioritize your own health and EMS people are notoriously bad about that. Myself being the worst, you know, my first year or my second year in EMS, I had been a, a paramedic for, you know, I, I'd been an EMT for five months before I started paramedic school. So by the time my first anniversary of EMS, I had gained 40 pounds. Most of that in, in a 15 week paramedic course, just, snacking and and drinking caffeinated drinks and and that sort of thing and and develop gastric reflux and everything else from our horrible eating habits it's not the it's not as active a a, a career as we would think it is and and our health suffers especially if you're in a, a system status management type system where you're street corner posting and eating the convenience store 3 a.m diet so it you know and and we are really quick and adept at spotting other people's medical issues while we ignore our own. And that's what I did. I ignored what was pretty obviously to any objective observer, a DVT. I ignored it for a year, rationalizing it was something else. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, DVTs happen to fat, sedentary people. <laughs> they don't Surprise. have to be, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, so to find out I had an 18 inch long DVT in my left leg was, was a a bit of a shock, but, you know, and then have a a pulmonary embolus on top of it and find out how close I came to dying, wake up call, you know, and I've had these, uh, I've had instances in the past where I said, you know, I got to get my butt in shape. And I did to a moderate degree, but I'm working on this one better. I'm, I'm trying to get where the only medication I wind up taking is an occasional ibuprofen. Not there yet, but won't be long. A couple, couple more months, maybe, and and we'll be able to evaluate and see if the clot is fully gone. Well, I mean, Last I checked, it was only three inches long. And that you're still talking about the DVT, ago. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So one of the things that I think one of the things it was 18 inches long when I was younger. So one of the things that I think is important, it's the it's the little changes that make the big difference, right? I mean, so yeah. a little bit, you know, I, I've always worried about diabetes. You know, my mom was diagnosed with diabetes back in the old days, and I started to gain a little bit of weight myself. So I decided just really just to cut out raw sugar. And when I talk about raw sugar, yeah. candy, cake, cookie, soda. And over the past 30 days, I've lost about 11 pounds, not doing anything else except cutting out sugar. Good for you. And one of the things that I've noticed as well is I'm not as hungry. And when I do sit down to eat, I'm not finishing my meal anymore, yeah. and which is really kind of interesting. So little by little, pounds just start to, to you know, come off. Melt off. Yeah. Melt. I was looking for the word. Thank you for the word melt. Thank you. <laughs> and But now if you start to add carbohydrates and minimizing bread and pastas, and, you know, it could make a big difference without even really having to get out of your house and go for a walk, which I think we should all do. You know, we, we work really hard, right? We spend 12 hours on the ambulance. Yeah. We take another hour to get home. Now we've got to be, be you know, be back on uh, shift in another 10 hours. You know, we have no time for all that, but we've got to be able to find a way to give ourselves the best opportunity for success. Well, you know, anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about today. Yeah. So. But I'm proud of you, man. I, I've worked with Appreciate you a it. lot of years. I know how challenging it's been for you to put yourself into a, you know, back into shape. But I think one of the things where this was truly a, a, a wake up call and you chose not to hit snooze, right? You chose really yeah. to do something about it. Yeah. And, you know, one year, 80 pounds, and you, you look like you have a little bit more energy. You're not falling asleep anymore mm -hmm. on the breaks where I've got to cut the, <laughs> I've got to cut the recording and splice it together. Uh, you're going to make me lo make us lose our PG 13 rating, man. <laughs> All right. We'll just back up a little bit then back up. <laughs> All right. So we got a topic for you to chat about. And one of the things that we do for our shows is, you know, we keep, we keep our ear to the grind, ear to the ground, our nose to the grindstone about stories and things that happen e in EMS. And on May 2nd, there was a article that came out, EMS poem to my medic from your EMT by Clay Gillum. He is an EMT basic. Don't know where you work, Clay, but we were inspired by your poem to kind of talk about it today. But go ahead and set it up for the listeners, Kelly. Yeah, I I thought this would be a nice way to show some love to our our EMT listeners because you know uh, paramedics get all the glory, but the the people that really make it happen on the call uh, are by and large the EMTs, and the vast majority of care rendered is basic life support care. Um, and and Clay puts it fairly well uh, what a good EMT partner does for their paramedic and makes our job so much easier. And I thought this was, you know, you, you should you should check out the poem because it's it's pretty pretty poignant and and lays it out there exactly what what you would hope for in a good EMT partner. But I think all too often we in this profession and when we're advocating for EMS system design and everything, it's it's paramedics, paramedics, paramedics. But I actually think that we might have too many paramedics. You know, I, I've said this in a in a column in the past that we we need to flip the paradigm. We don't need to, especially in these rural areas, we need to do away with paramedic intercepts. We need to have BLS intercepts instead of having a paramedic on every truck and and this sort of thing. Do like uh, do a, a tiered response system where the vast majority of care is provided by EMT trucks, and then have a small cadre paramedics who handle the the truly ALS calls triage those to, to the paramedic trucks and that way the EMTs get good experience they they're they you know carry most of the workload of the system and they're they're developing clinical experience and the paramedics are only doing paramedic things thus there's very little skill rust out and skill degradation and and skill dilution because you don't, you're not trying to dry, divide, you know, a finite number of intubations among a huge number of paramedics, you know. So, and that has worked in combining had such a system. And and in the outlying areas, if you staffed a community clinic with with community paramedics who would, you know, rotate them out once every once every three weeks or a month, let them let them spend a week in the vacation station where they're not run to death and and 
if they have a call, they run the call. But if it doesn't require paramedic level care, call a BLS intercept from the city and bring them on in. You know, and I think we we kind of in EMS we we focus on the wrong things. And I think our system design is is the paradigm needs to be flipped 180 degrees. You know. Well, I think one of the challenges of that, I mean, I agree with you 100%. And I think one of the mistakes I made in my EMS career was creating dual paramedic trucks, you know, back in 2010, 2011, yeah. 2012. And I had the intention of building a community paramedic program inside my organization. And I didn't think about that as a value of putting the paramedics into the community paramedic program, increasing the BLS units capabilities with protocol and you and I have talked about the different level of skill that I think that we can let paramedic EMTs do, eye gel placements, you know, back in the old days yeah. uh, where they had intermediates, we were able to start IVs. So you could teach an EMT how to start an IV or, you know, up there in Rhode Island, they used to have the EMT C's, the cardiacs, right? Yeah, so cardiac those, they were able to run uh, uh, codes and things like that. And I think one of the things that we need to be able to look at is how do we make that a practice? But- the big challenge in EMS was the fact of all the leaders who were trying to go out for RFPs were saying, this is the better model. The we better need model. paramedics. You need paramedics. Yeah, exactly. And as we now get into the shortage after COVID, as we now get into everybody's now saying, well, maybe we don't need paramedics on every single truck. And they're doing that yeah. because it's more of a, you know, they're pushed into the, into that practice that we can't find paramedics anymore. And I think that that's very, very short-sighted that they were using paramedics on an ambulance for tactics of the organizational success and not really what was best for the, because it amazes me now, Kelly, I, I sometimes I just want to walk up and uh, give somebody a shove when I hear them say, uh, oh, I don't think we need a paramedic on every truck where these were the staunch advocates for paramedics yeah. on every truck. Yeah. And I think that we are now seeing the value of what EMTs can do. And you're going to start to see that change more and more, I think, in our career field. Yeah. You know, and it it, it amazes me that that so many systems are are still clinging, zealously clinging to an antiquated model that is not working for them anymore. You know, pick any state in this country. Everyone has an EMS shortage. No one is immune to it. Yet in some states, you have mandated by law that that every paramedic truck is a dual paramedic truck. You know, and and they're and and out of the other side of their mouth, they complain that they don't have enough paramedics. You know, why not make it paramedic crew configuration? Make that acceptable. The people that are flush with 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 paramedics, they, they still staff a dual paramedic truck, but change the law so that an EMT and a paramedic can work together. And boom, you have just doubled the number of available paramedics. I, I And you can't tell me, because there is no data to support it, that two paramedics are better than a paramedic and EMT. And, and in my own personal experience, especially, no experience especially anecdote does not equal data. Especially when one of those paramedics is going to drive to the hospital. Yes, exactly. You know, I I have spent 30 years in paramedic EMT systems. Everywhere I've worked, being double stacked with another paramedic is a rare luxury, but it's never been necessary. Never have I, in my career, I can I recall a time where, man, if I had another paramedic on this call, it would be great. And the times that I, when we you do need maybe another ALS provider, we generally get them in a timely fashion. But I've never been in a situation where I said, man, I, I my EMT is not, not useful here. I, I need another paramedic to bounce these ideas off of. Never felt limited by an EMT, uh, by having only an EMT partner. Uh, and I shouldn't say only. I, yeah. An EMT partner is, and I tell my partners when I, when, it's the Kelly getting to know you speech. It's like, look, 70% of our patients don't even need an ambulance. They really don't. 70% of the people in that emergency department should not be there, no, much less care. require an ambulance to get there. I think everybody um, who goes to the hospital has to be there. Yeah. Well, not in the emergency department. No. Yeah. And that's uh, one of the things. And that's, I, but again, that goes to the challenge of EMS where we only get paid when we transport people to the hospital. That's true. And we're starting to see more and more states 
that are now pushing for the insurance companies to pay for treatment. The state agencies are now going to start pushing the state funded insurance companies to pay for treat no transport and alternative destinations. So yeah. we need to have more states follow suit, but that's not really what we're talking about today. We're really talking about the value of an EMT. And I got to tell you, I had, I've had some, I was so lucky in my career. I've had some great EMT partners. You know, Jeff Ellison was a great partner. Jeff Ellison really kind of pissed, you know, irritated me. Let's say that I was going to use a different term, but as I was working, he'd start handing me stuff and, uh, you know, I was taking umbrage to the fact of, that he's given me stuff that I haven't even asked for. And Jeff was a para, an EMT who was very, very astute into what was going on. And he'd be handing me things that I never asked for. And one of the things that I took a little bit of umbrage to it, like, what the heck is that about? And uh, come to find out, that's what I would have needed next if I would have thought, you know, a little bit more. And he was anticipating exactly what was happening in the truck and exactly what the next steps were. And one of the challenges that I think we had was I had to change a little bit of my practice to kind of meet his his uh, experience and knowledge. But he was a great partner. Razor Nix was a good partner. His name was Jamie Nix. Yeah. We called him Razor. He said, well, why are you calling me Razor? I said, well, if anybody asks you why, you tell them because you're the sharpest EMT here, but it's because you don't shave on a regular basis. That's why I'm calling you Razor. And, Razor Nix. <laughs> yeah. Alex Simmons, like Simmons, was a great partner for me. Sarah Chase was my last partner uh, that I had before I went into the operation side of the business, clinical side of the business. And uh, But those are, those are EMTs that really kind of gave us, and actually Sarah was a paramedic lex was a paramedic but they still were able to anticipate the things that were going on when i worked in the medstar system just because you were a paramedic if you weren't signed off as a primary paramedic you weren't able to run the truck right so you still yeah. acted even though you were a paramedic and you could work up to your skills the primary paramedic on the truck was responsible for all aspects but these yeah. were people that had great foresight uh, they had great conceptualization their experience was steeped in mistakes and failures that they polished and grew and just very, very lucky. And when we think about the value of a great EMT partner, and I, I used to see the shirts and the bumper stickers that a good EMT keeps the paramedic out of trouble. Gosh, Kelly, yeah. that is so true. It is. It is. It's it's a cliche, but cliches become cliches because they contain a, a big nugget of truth and, and paramedics save lives. EMT save paramedics is, is that cliche. But man, is there anything better than having that partner who is so in tune with you that you don't get to complete sentences? They do it for you. You know, you can say, hey, man, hand me up. And before you get it out of your mouth, it's in your hand. You know, I need a and you look over and they're handing it to you already. They're right there with you. And, and God, to me, that's what makes an EMS call beautiful, you know, where, where it's, you know, it's, it's, it becomes it's, it becomes art. Yes, yes, it becomes art. And conversely, when you have a partner that you have to tell everything and explain everything and you don't get along, there is nothing more torturous than a shift in an ambulance with someone you don't work well with. Well, hang on uh, a second. Hang on a second. Let, let's back that up a little bit because uh, Sarah didn't become Sarah right away. Jamie didn't become yeah. Jamie, right? Jeff didn't become Jeff right away. So when you think about that from a torturous side, somebody took the time either to polish them or these folks were just so far oh. ahead oh, yeah. that they were able to anticipate. So sometimes that torturous oh, yeah. call in, you know, with that partner really comes out to developing a great partner. So think about oh, no, that. No, 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 I'm, I'm, no. I, I agree with you. I, they, good EMTs don't happen in a vacuum. Someone taught them to be that way. And plus they had the character traits and the personality to, to excel. And, but I, I'm talking about the ones who, won't learn the ones who who just do what you told them to do the sad thing is is many of those emts who only do what they're told to do and they they do not contribute in any meaningful fashion until you tell them to do something the the be silent and and don't talk and and you're just there to hand me stuff and fetch my equipment emts were created by a douchebag par paramedic some paramedic who was unsure of themselves and projected that lack of confidence onto their EMT partners and taught them that you were to be seen and not heard and, and that sort of thing. 
working with a with an EMT like that who has been ruined by by a bad paramedic is is not fun. I tried with every partner I ever had, and and for for ten years at Acadian Ambulance, that's basically what I did. Well, I took brand new EMTs with the ink still wet on their cards and seasoned them up to be good partners for another paramedic. And then when they would get the six months or so of experience under their belt, they would get off my my horrible shift and, and go to a shift that was more conducive to go into paramedics, and they would do that. And I'd get new paramedics fresh out of school, and I would I would spend a couple of months with them, getting them prepped to to run their own truck. And and those kind of things where where your communication is intuitive, you start a sentence and they finish it. Thanks, just what makes makes EMS an art for me, and and that's what I love. Well, let's go ahead and but, ch- switch gears a little bit know, here. So the other I don't side of that coin is is a grind. Yeah, I don't know that we were going to talk about this really. We were really just going to pay an ode to uh, Clay Gillum, and then I found a little bit more about Clay. His dream of becoming an EMT mm-hmm. at fifty years old. And has been one for 12 years. And after nine years with AMR Riverside County, California, he now works for acute rescue and transport in Boise, Idaho as an EMTB. So Clay, you inspired this week's show. So thank you for that. But, you know, the question is, let's switch gears a little bit. And you talked about a couple of things. You talked about one, preparing EMTs for paramedic school or preparing paramedics to get their own truck. What is the responsibility of a paramedic when they have an EMT partner into helping and guiding them into the next level of their professional development. One of the things that I think we have as a challenge is we allow our ego to dictate our actions sometimes. And EMT is there for me, carry the bag, get the cot, blah, blah, blah. Almost the same thing we do to fire uh, EMTs, right? As we treat them bad sometimes with disrespect. But now as we're paramedics and we have our own truck and we have some responsibility, what is our focus on helping EMTs develop to the next level in their career, Kelly? What, what do you give the listeners? Well, I'm going to steal a, a, a Chris Sevaleroism. I don't think it's necessarily getting them prepared for the next level because some, some people don't aspire to be a paramedic. And that's, you know, that's fine. That's fine. If you want to be an EMT and an EMT is as far as you want to go, that's fine. What we owe it to our partners is to be the very best EMT that they can be. So if you have no intention of going higher to paramedic, that's fine. But there is no ceiling on knowledge. But, but let me pause. When I say next level, it's not necessarily next certification okay. level. It's the yeah. next level in where you are. So when we come into a job, we may be a five on a 10 scale. How do we yeah. help them get to a 10 on a 10 scale with skill yeah. mastery? So it's not necessarily certification. Get them, get them up that next level in the Dreyfus model of, of skill acquisition. Yeah, it's it's about being the best EMT you can and to be an independent thinker so that the what you do and the way you think and 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 treat patients and your clinical reasoning is intuitive and you become a master of pattern recognition. You know, the whole scope of practice thing and BLS versus ALS, that's an artificial in the sand by regulators for reimbursement purposes. Really care is just care. There's a continuum of it. And the borders between BLS and ALS are very, very fuzzy. But one thing I've learned is the state may say you cannot do certain skills, but the state cannot say you cannot know these things. There is no cap on your knowledge. So the more knowledgeable my EMT is about my thought processes and and what goes into good patient care, even if they can't do those things themselves, they are a far better trained set of hands for the purpose for the person who's officially blessed to hold that laryngoscope or or read that EKG rhythm or or whatever. So I think paramedics, if you're grooming a new EMT, how do you you create a good one? Create an EMT that thinks. Encourage them to think, not just do what you tell them to. Welcome questions and remember that there's no ceiling on their knowledge. Teach them as much as you can, and you're going to wind up with a much better EMT for it. But hey, (laughs) that's what we think. We'd like to hear what you think. Email us at the show at ems1.com. And for myself and co-host Chris Sevalero, thanks for tuning in Inside EMS. We're going to catch y'all next week.